Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Jim Fallows, who is the national correspondent of the Atlantic Monthly. He served as the Atlantic Monthly's Washington editor from 1979 to 1996, and is now the magazine's national correspondent. Uh, James Fallows graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard in 1970 and then studied economics at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He's been an editor of the Washington Monthly and of Texas Monthly. And from 1977 to 1979, he served as President Jimmy Carter's chief speechwriter. He's the author of several books, including National Defense, More Like Us, Looking at the Sun, and most recently, Breaking the News, How the Media Undermine American Democracy. Jim, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much, Harry. Where were you born and raised? I was actually born in Philadelphia. This is a fact I tend to conceal because I like to present myself as a California guy, but I, I came at a young age to Redlands, California. My uh, parents were part of the great post-World War II migration, and they came out from their Philadelphia roots to Redlands, where I grew up and had a basically an American graffiti upbringing in the 50s and 60s in Southern California. And, and how do your parents shape your character in this very California setting? Uh, I think that, that um, my parents, although highly compatible and still married, you know, 50 odd years into their, uh, their relationship are very different and I will have a sort of yin-yang theory of taking <laughs> some from each of them. My, wife, my, my mother is a great traditionalist. She uh, routinely moans about the loss of uh, the Wissahickon Inn and other sort of things from the East Coast that she uh, she misses in, in California. And I have some of her sentimental side. My father, I'm probably more like. He is a real, um, uh, he likes doing something different every day. And, and he uh, very much um, liked the idea of escaping what he saw as sort of the traps of the past in the East Coast and going out to California in the most cliched way of just being able to start life over and do things new and that's uh, and he took up all sorts of new hobbies in, in California from horse riding to becoming a, an auxiliary policeman and now after his retirement he's working as a computer programmer so he uh, I see some of my own self in him. In, in your book uh, 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 More Like Us you draw uh, very much on your early upbringing uh, to come to a, a kind of an understanding of the American character. And in the course of that discussion, you describe your father as the original autodictat. He thought he could learn to do anything if he tried. I was um, both describing my, my father, whom I both admire and love, and also trying to make a point about how our nation works. And this is a uh, my, my father's, um, his father, I don't believe, went to college. I, I know that, that his mother didn't, and so he would have been the first person in his family, along with his older brother, to go to college. They went there as part of the World War II uh, GI Bill. So coming from fairly modest background in, uh, in Philadelphia, he was able to be, uh, become a medical doctor because of the Navy's V-12 program, and they just thought uh, anything would be open to him. I remember when, when my siblings and I were little kids, we'd be rolled out of bed at 5.30 to watch Sunrise Semester, because my dad was learning Greek at the time. We had to learn <laughs> Greek with him, and we had to learn physics, and we had to learn this or that. And so he um, thought that there was no traditional constraint on what he could be or do or learn. And in some way, I think that that was part of the American spirit I was trying to argue in contrast, say, to the sodden Europeans who think, well, if it wasn't done this way 50, uh, you know, five centuries ago, why should we dare? Or the Japanese, among whom I was living then, who had this idea of what was the accepted thing and the non-accepted mm -hmm. thing. My father had no idea of the accepted thing. It was mm -hmm. a thing that he wanted to do, and that I thought was the American way. And, and you know, in your book here, you, you, you're describing what it was like to be under his uh, tutelage. <laughs> and you say here, uh, he decided to, re uh, because of his Rush wartime education, he had never taken a college course in liberal arts. He decided uh, to remedy that for himself. For a year or two, he studied Greek early in the morning, then Hebrew, then a systematic <laughs> empire by empire course in ancient history, then Shakespeare. When I was in the fourth and fifth grades, he made me get up with him at 6 a.m. to watch Sunrise Semester. You can see how I've embroidered the story because I've turned it into 5.30. Yeah, I, I guess that's right. <laughs> six is the more accurate yeah. rendition. And this, this, is, <laughs> this is part of the American way that I think is often ridiculed from the European perspective. Mm -hmm. You read all these novels from even Henry James, who became, in fact, a European uh, after a while, would sort of make fun of these Americans with their crash courses and learn the classics in mm -hmm. three months and, and learn this or that. Uh, but I think it is um, part of 
the idea that people can do that is the essential difference between the U.S. in general and the rest of the world, and California in particular compared to the rest of, of the U.S., or the Sun Belt generally. And so this seemed to me admirable, even though it had its ludicrous sides. For example, I remember very clearly my dad taking us out in a sailboat with a how-to-sail manual on his knees. <laughs> so we were trying to learn about jibing and coming about um, from the book while in the middle of a big windstorm. That was not such a good experiment. <laughs> What, what books did you read as a young person that you think affected you? Well, I had, um, I, I'm sure my worst um, secret, although shared with many other former teenagers, is dipping into the works of Ayn Rand as a, <laughs> as a California teenager That's and thinking, yes, this is how it should be. Mm -hmm. Really, no one else should interfere with me in my ascent through life. Uh, but I was um, put on this forced march through the classics and through a lot of, uh, through historical biographies, both by teachers and, and by my, my dad. So I think I read... The books that probably made the biggest impact on me were, on the one hand, the whole landmark series of biographies. These were, this was a very interesting series put out in the 50s and early 60s by Random House of maybe 200 page biographies of Benjamin Franklin, Julius Caesar, Lawrence, Yogi Berra, you know, y you name it, uh, great mm -hmm. figures of our time. And so a sense of how the arc of different people's lives, you know, affected how, how they turned out. That was interesting. And I remember also reading the H.G. Wells and the Hendrick Van Loon sort of pocket histories of mankind. And they also were interesting in sort of saying, uh, here, here are the big patterns you should see, learning to think about things in, in big patterns. And perhaps to a fault, I absorbed that. And, and when you went on to school as an undergraduate, you went to Harvard. Right. Uh, tell us about that, that experience <coughs> and, and how it affected what you became. It was jarring in six or eight or ten uh, different ways. Um, the background was I went off to college in the fall of 1966, and I'd, I'd rarely been out of California. I had sort of no conscious experience out of Southern California at that point. Uh, and the circumstances of Redlands in those days were, were almost identical to the movie American Graffiti. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was the life. And the, when I went to, to uh, college, number one, it was in Boston, which was different in climatic terms from anything I've been used to, very different in social terms. I'd never known anybody who went to a prep school, for example. That was where you sent discipline problems. And suddenly, half the class is people from Groton and Exeter and places like this. Um, Redlands had virtually, Redlands' um, ethnic diversity in my childhood was a Hispanic population, but very few blacks and almost no Jews. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very different uh, mix uh, there. At the time of the Vietnam War, I'd gone intending just to become a doctor, not just to become, but that's what I had in mind. But I became uh, sort of all mixed up, as many people were in those days, by just all the political, economic, cultural, et cetera, et cetera, changes. Ended up getting interested in journalism and having many close friends from that time, but also many sort of um, memories of upheaval. Uh, and you were a business officer at the Crimson, <laughs> and uh, 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 your, your conversion uh, uh, from medicine to uh, a, a medicine wannabe to a journalist uh, came as a result of uh, a fire, right? <laughs> Is that the story? Uh, yes, that was the, uh, the, the moment along the road to Damascus <laughs> for, for me. I had been selling ads for the paper, trying to earn money. I was in the office late one night laying out the advertising dummy, and there was nobody else there because it was exam period. And this was in a freezing cold night in Boston. It was like 20 below zero. Uh, I'm probably exaggerating that too, but it was cold. Well, you're from California. Yes, so, that's so it seemed like that. <laughs> that's right. uh, and I heard the fire bell go off, and it turned out the Harvard Economics Department was burning down. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty cold because the fire trucks, they tried to put out the fire. The water was freezing as it came out of the, of the hoses. So I thought, this is interesting. And I was interviewing this one pathetic figure who was wearing an Indian turban and whose life's work was burning up in the fire, a man named, I think, Subramanian Swami or some name like that. He went on to become finance minister of India. And I got to write the story for the newspaper. A couple days later, there was a Hell's Angels beating in Cambridge. I got to write about that. And I thought, this is fun. So we ended up shifting from the business to the editorial side of the paper. And you then became, a, you, you became editor. Of I, I did become the editor. That was, I guess it was in my, um, I can't remember if it was my freshman or I think it was my freshman year that this, this happened halfway through. By my senior year was the editor. It was a very intense time. Frank Rich, who's now a writer for the New York Times on the paper then. Um, Mike Kinsley was, David Ignatius, who's the editor of the International Herald Tribune. Uh, Evan Thomas, who's a editor at Newsweek. A lot of other very interesting, very intense people. So most of the memories I have of college are of working with those people 10 hours a day, trying to put out the next day's paper, which was a great experience. And then from Harvard, you went on to uh, England as a Root Scholar. Yes, I, and what I did. what did you study there? I studied economics. I began studying law. For the first year, I studied law, and I thought, this is interesting enough. But there was an, an intriguing difference in how the law was taught in England, which was in the US, 
you go to law school if you want to become kind of master of the world. At least that was the case a quarter century ago when I was doing this. And in England, you go to law school to learn how to draw up contracts. And so the actual <laughs> contents may not be that different, but you think the sort of higher, there's none of this kind of gloss on it. You're going to be running the world. So uh, you were immunized earlier yes. against uh, wanting to be one uh, <laughs> so for a I lifetime. Thought, you know, I, I can see all these term, you know, these terms of settling an estate, but mm -hmm. do I really want to do this? So I shifted to studying economics, which is what English people want to do. That's their version of law school. If they want to be big cheeses, they study economics. So I studied that, which was interesting. The main lesson I took from England was that I was a yank, that I really uh, <laughs> belonged back in my homeland. And England was fine, but I, my instincts, my accent, everything else belonged to America. And, and your, your work on economic theory became later very important <laughs> to you, right? Because it, it laid the groundwork for, for the kinds of things that you really wanted to critique, actually, theories yes. about how the world worked economically. I think that any real economist would view that year and a half I spent studying economics at Oxford as a huge um, mistake because it's in the a little bit of learning is dangerous category. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that it was a way to get sort of the basic premises of the business. And so what were your first writing jobs uh, as a journalist? Uh, well, it depends on whether you're counting a job, something you get paid for. <laughs> when I, I, was, I came back from England in 1972 to work for Ralph Nader, who I'd worked for. I actually wrote a quickie book for him in 1970 and again one in 1972. And this was on what topic? Or? Uh, the one in 1970 was called The Water Lords and actually right. is a respectable book. It was the case study of one city, Savannah, Georgia, mm -hmm. and the way a big company there sort mm -hmm. of ran the city. The one in 1972 was called Who Runs Congress? Mm -hmm. And Mark Green, who was now a politician in New York, York. David Zwick, who's now a lawyer, and I were locked into a basement for two months, mm -hmm. and we produced this book at the end of it, a paperback book, which sold like hotcakes, mm -hmm. although we got none of the money. We got, I think, $500 for the summer, but that was my first quasi-paying job. I then worked for the Washington Monthly for a couple of years, then the Texas Monthly after that. And uh, let's talk a little about uh, journalism, because some of the people who might read this site might be interested in, in, in going... Uh, uh, into that field, and, and there are a number of, of topics I want to talk. And and uh, the first one I think is uh, how do you how do you find your subjects, or do your subjects find you? Let me answer that indirectly, and in, in saying what it is you're trying to do in this business, yeah. or or what what at its best that the business can be. I think um, I always mistrust people in journalism who say they like writing. Because anybody, almost anybody I know who takes writing seriously and does it for a living really hates the actual writing. Mm -hmm. I just hate writing things. It's always difficult. You know, it's the hardest thing I know how to, I, I, I routinely do because you're always trying to figure how can I make this clearer? How can I get to the point I'm really trying to, to get across? How can I convey what I've seen? The reason you do it, despite that penalty of the unpleasantness of writing, is the the thrill, the satisfaction, the enjoyment of seeing things, of just being able to learn about new things. So mm -hmm. to me, the proper subject is usually the latest thing you've seen that you want to tell somebody about. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the guiding impulse for journalism usually should be saying, hey, you can't believe what I just saw. Mm -hmm. You know, just wanting to grab somebody by the lapel and mm -hmm. say, I just saw the most interesting thing, and here's uh, what, what you'd know if you had seen it too. So um, in process terms, choosing subjects involves the editor you're working for, the reporting you've done, the lead you cultivate, all these things. But the underlying impulse is saying, I've just seen something interesting and I'd like to tell you about it. So it all sort of flows from that. Right. And uh, 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 in your case, uh, there seems to be a, a focus on recurring themes. I mean, you, you seem to be interested in the interface, among other things, of culture, society, and technology. What are the roots of that, do you think, uh, other than what we just talked about yes. with regard to your father? One, again, I'll answer this somewhat in indirectly. I have always liked, perhaps to a fault, being in different places and doing different things. Mm -hmm. I, I view a satisfaction of journalism the fact that, that it essentially gives you virtual lives. You're able to have the experience of people in 10 or 15 different livelihoods mm -hmm. in one lifetime. A penalty for that is that you never really build up the sort of institutional connections in a certain place, in a certain field, and certain kinds of expertise. But for example, after my wife and I got married in the summer of 71, we had known each other in college, and we got married after my first year at Oxford, our honeymoon was a couple of months on a work gang in Ghana. 
And it just was, was interesting to see what Ghana was You were was writing like. about that? Or? Uh, no. It, actually, the reason we did this was there was a postal strike in England for four months before this. We couldn't write to anybody. Mm -hmm. There was no email. Then. We couldn't write to people. We couldn't afford to telephone them to figure out something to do in the summer. So we saw these posters on the wall in, in uh, Oxford of, you know, free summer work in Africa. <laughs> and it, it seemed warm. <laughs> and it was free. So mm -hmm. we, anyhow, we ended up being on this labor mm -hmm. gang in Ghana. And it just was interesting to see another place. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell people about what it was like in Ghana. And so since then, every two or three years, except when our kids are in high school, we've, we've moved someplace else and done something different. And so I think the experience of seeing a lot of different ways mm -hmm. of life makes you reflect on what it is in the culture that affects how people achieve, how they don't achieve, mm -hmm. what their material circumstances are, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, in, 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 in addition to this moving around uh, uh, and, and looking at different worlds, once you do that, you, you emphasize in, in one of your books the importance of, of looking, learning, and reporting. Uh, the, the importance of not losing sight of the facts. This is, comes as part of a critique of, of today's journalism and so on. Tell us a little about that because, because in your work process as one goes through all these books, it's very clearly you, you, you inundate yourself with both written material, but also you have to go there and experience yourself, which is what you did when you wrote your books on the Asian economies. It's, I don't know if this is a temperamental matter that draws people into journalism or if it's something that people develop when they're in journalism, mm -hmm. but I find it almost impossible or make really nervous making if I'm writing about something that I haven't seen mm -hmm. or writing about a person that I, who I haven't talked to. I mean, that, that, that it's, uh, so I think it's a combination of, of nature and nurture, but you feel as if you can't really describe what a city looks like if you haven't actually been there. Mm -hmm. And just, just uh, now I'm sure historical novelists get around this by reading things mm -hmm. about, you know, the layout of ancient Baghdad or, or, or whatever. But it is, um, maybe this is making a virtue, maybe this is putting a gloss on something that actually is a consumer benefit of being a journalist, of getting to go see different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But, but I, th I feel as if the basic claim on legitimacy from the reader's point of view you have as a writer is if they know you have been out there and seen things and you can say number one I saw this number two I learned these things which I'm passing on to you I didn't know before so perhaps mm -hmm. you didn't know before and number three on the basis of having seen and learned these things I conclude the following and I'm mm -hmm. going to try to persuade you to think the, the same too so I think it's that one two three process and uh, when journalism airs perhaps to anticipate your next question mm -hmm. it's when uh, either the cultural imperatives or other things sort of get people away from the taking in new information it becomes all the processing of the spin. I like that as much as the next person, but I think it's a di diversion from what the real mission of the business is. And and let let's be let's get to the facts right here. When <laughs> when in the late '80s uh, we were being stunned by the economic challenge from Asia, you literally took your family and moved there, and for a number of years traveled all around coming to understand uh, what was at the heart of, of, of these new economies that s posed such a threat to uh, our economic yeah. way of life. It was tremendous fun. We were in, in Asia for about four years, and our kids, when we left, were, I think they were five and eight. So we came back when our older son was basically going into eighth grade, and so it was time to, to get back and, and to be in a more normal situation because they'd been in Japanese public schools for a while, and they'd been out of school for mm -hmm. a year or so as we traveled around. And it just was fascinating to see um, such a variety of cultures, you know, from Korea to Burma to Indonesia to Japan to China, but also to see them at a time of ascent mm -hmm. and to try to guess how much of this ascent was temporary, how much was based on governmental institutions, how much was based on culture, just to try to deal with all those things. And, and for similar reasons, I wanted to see Silicon Valley in the last year or two because with the net boom, it's been interesting to see this culture on ascent, in ascent, and to try to assess it in similar terms. And, 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 and in a way, as, as I, I read through your material, uh, you, 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 the, these, this, this creativity that emerges out of this process really uh, comes from going there, seeing there, reporting it, and then putting it down on paper, but putting it down with a, a clarity that can help people understand what's at work. Um, I appreciate your, your putting it that way. What I, I, you know, journalism has lots of different branches. Writing has lots of different branches. The part 
I think I should stick to. The part I feel mm -hmm. most comfortable in is more or less what you described of going out and trying to to see things the reader may not have seen, mm -hmm. you know, serving as the sort of remote intelligence system for the re reader. I'm using intelligence not in the IQ sense, but in sort of the CIA type sense right, of getting right. new data, and then saying, if you had, I mean, then telling, offering this bargain to the reader that if you give me your time and attention, I will at least give you some new information you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something about how Bangkok looks or, mm -hmm. or how uh, Rangoon looks. And then I will at least present a way to think about this. And you don't have to accept part two. You don't have to accept the way of thinking about it. But I'll show you the stages that led to my conclusion. And you can see whether that gives you a di more useful lens for viewing these things, a, di a different framework for thinking about so, it. So that at least you feel the responsibility to shake people up with your view of things, even if they disagree? Yes, yes. The, the, the idea is, is that, that people need both the inchoate data mm -hmm. and they need categories. They need ways of saying, okay, this is important and this is not. This is rising, this is falling, this is good, this, this is bad. And so, uh, well, I hadn't thought of it in just these terms before you, you, you were asking this. I do think that that one-two combo of new information and a, and a new and perhaps clearer way of thinking about things, even if you disagree with that framework, I think that's at some value. Now, in, in the poor, uh, course of, of, of gathering this material, uh, the interview, the on-site interview is very important to you. Talking to the people right. who are making the decision or by the way they live, you know, changing the world around them or anybody else to get a, a, a complete picture of what's going on. Uh, what's the key to doing a good interview? There's another temperamental factor, which in my experience is basically true, and then I'll, I'll talk about procedure. I think it was... Um, Harrison Salisbury, who is, I, I believe, and I, I think he is now deceased. He was correspondent for the New York Times and Vietnam and Russia and every place mm -hmm. else. He pointed out that many people who went to journalism were by nature shy people who are looking for a structural mm. excuse to go ask about things. That's, that's true in my case and true of a lot of people I know. You look for sort of an institutional reason to go pry into other things and go in a way that you wouldn't do in your, your natural state of mind. And so the impulse is to go learn about things. And I find the way, uh, my basic interviewing technique is not Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes saying, well, you know, when did you stop beating your wife? It's essentially saying, can you explain this to me? Can you tell me what you're doing mm -hmm. here and what's important about it? You know, what's interesting about it? And so I usually um, go in there and just try to ask the person a number of framing questions. You know, how did you end up doing what you're doing now? What are the big three things that are going here? What are you concerned about? What are you worried about? What do people misunderstand about what you're doing? Mm -hmm. What are the two strongest arguments against your theory? What was the most important thing that led you to your conclusion? Just trying to have them, uh, you can then get them to do some of the work of the thinking for it, because they, they've, they've spent more time thinking about it than you have, mm -hmm. and it just is all sorts of raw material you can then use to, to share with the reader later on. This, this what I would call non-confrontational, uh, uh, empathetic uh, relationship uh, uh, helps us understand <clears throat> something that emerges uh, in all of your work, which is a, a kind of effort to give a de Tocquevillian rendering of a situation uh, that, that uh, uh, and Yes. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, of course, <laughs> you, I, I like any quality lit type comparison. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but it is, I mean, in other words, it, 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 well, let, let's, let's talk about some of your works. You, 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 uh, one of your first uh, books was uh, uh, The National Defense, uh, which I can show since I have, <laughs> uh, and, one of, and your last book is really about uh, breaking the news, uh, actually. Uh, a, a critique in essence of, of the media. Now, in, in both cases, you're looking at institutions, you know, uh, on the one hand at what you see as their decline. Uh, on the other hand, you're going in and you're trying to understand what's going on, but also find the rays of hopes, the, the, the places where people are dissatisfied and are seeking reform. Right. And, and in both cases, you, you really do have to give us a comprehensive mm -hmm. view of what's going on. Well, people who don't like me, of, of whom there are a sufficient, <laughs> sufficient number, uh, would, would make two criticisms of, of this kind of approach. First, they'd say that it's too scolding and yeah, yeah, yeah. Your work. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
No, me, me personally, not not uh, this general school of, of thought. Yeah, okay. uh, that, that's too scolding and, and fault finding. And second, that the people the people presented there are not sort of novelistic Dostoevsky and rich characters, mm -hmm. but are there just as proxies for for the points I'm trying to make. And I will somewhat concede the second uh, that, that that often. You know, I, I'm not Tom Wolfe in trying to in having you know memorable or or John Updike and having truly memorable human characters. I do my best to try to, but but I often think of the characters in their instrumental role of how they're advancing or mm -hmm. retarding these various institutional um, struggles. On the the other point about scolding, I, I I think what I'm trying to do is, as you describe, is saying institutions go through healthier and less healthy mm -hmm. stages of evolution. And it's interesting to see what are the patterns that make institutions struggle, whether it's the U.S. automakers in the mid-70s before the Japanese shook them up, or the Def Defense Department after Vietnam, or I'd say the news business now, and what can be done about that? What made it go wrong and what can be done? And then you can, it's to me interesting to find the people who are responsible for big decisions, the people who are trying to change things. So those are the, uh, that's why I describe it in the way that you were talking about. And, and in fact, it's those people who reflect some of the ambivalences and, and tensions of what's going on. And, and you seem to be suggestion, <coughs> suggesting in, let's take these two books, that uh, some of the, the better people lose sight of the central purpose of the activity. In the case of the uh, analysis of the of uh, the business of defense, uh, or the I shouldn't say business, but the the, the profession of, of being a soldier, what you what you found was that uh, many of the soldiers were being asked to be uh, managers right. and uh, procurers of uh, uh, defense uh, uh, weaponry of, of very high sophistication. In the case of of journalists, you were arguing that many of them were becoming celebrities, and 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 so that in both cases they were uh, deviating from the central purpose. Right. In the case of soldiers, to fight wars. In uh, the case of reporters, uh, to tell the story so people could understand. Um, again, I hadn't thought of the connection in just this way in, until you raised it, but there is this other theme uh, linking these two cases. You can think of. There are certain institutions where if people just follow the incentives that are most tempting before them, that will be good for the whole institution. Mm -hmm. For example, in most of the business world, if each individual tries to get rich, that will probably be good for the business because mm -hmm. the business is a matter of trying to look for market opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. But there are certain institutions where that's not so. If journalists are mainly, and these are institutions where the fundamental purpose of that whole body is something other than the simple market success. Education is one of those, child rearing, medicine, uh, the military, and journalism. And so there is a tension between some of the alluring market incentives on people in those businesses and what the whole institution is called upon to serve. And so if soldiers mainly become careerists of just looking for promotion, that can be bad for the institution. If journalists mainly are looking for maximizing their income, mm -hmm. the same w w with educators, and there's always a tension because people are people, people care about money, about name, about influence, et cetera. But there are certain institutions where it's a more complicated balance than it might be in the bond trading market, where everybody just wants to get rich and that's all it's about. Mm -hmm. And it's about more than that in the military, more than that in, in journalism. and so. That complicated tension is something that, that I think connects these fields. Is there something common about the uh, the people in these different institutions who want to reform things, who want to make them better? Uh, yes, they have the burr under the saddle that makes them attractive <laughs> to people like me. Uh, that, that they're you know that, that they are. Uh, I mean, in the crassest sense, the reason they're attractive to journalists is they've often done a lot of the thinking for you. Mm -hmm. For example, I talk about the military reformers in, in national defense. And these were people, Chuck Spinney, John Boyd, Pierre Spray, others whom I haven't thought about for a long time but still really respect, mm -hmm. who had thought for quite a while about what is structurally wrong with the design of the F-15? What is structurally wrong with the way the Air Force buys planes in general? What's wrong with the career path in the Army? And so. You can happen upon these people as I did, and they've worked on this for years. And you can spend three months listening to mm -hmm. them and you know sort of imbibe mm -hmm. their wisdom. Same. So reformers in general are interesting people. I like them by temperament, and they've done much of my work for me. So that's mm -hmm. why I gravitate towards them. Mm -hmm. Now, a after all of this discussion of, of the work you do and how you do it, what what are 
what are, is implicit in your philosophy about the, uh, <clears throat> the craft of journalism? In, in reading this, what you've written and what is implied, I, I draw the sense that you're, you, you see your mission as one of public education, of, of contributing to a general understanding uh, of a problem. Is that, is that fair? Uh, yes, although the word public education makes my back hairs okay. rise. Give me a better uh, word. But, and, and the reason, the reason is that, the, the, again, there's a whole camp within journalism. Mm -hmm. that there are two reasons why, why, why I resist that. One is it suggests a kind of didacticism and talking down to people, which is not what, what mm -hmm. I mean. As you and I speak, the U.S. has recently gone through an election campaign where, uh, where one of the problems for, for Al Gore was he was he had a great difficulty explaining things to people without seeming to talk down, without seeming to be educating the public. Whereas Bill Clinton, you know, a, a brilliant man in my view, was able to explain things without ever seeming to patronize in, in that same way. So I, I don't mean patronizing education. And also, there is a camp within journalism which just goes, takes up its arms over the idea that there's any kind of informative or improving a role in journalism. I would put it this way. Uh, that what j journalism is the, again, it's the sense organs of society. It is the eyes and ears and smell and touch and to some degree the brain, only a limited degree of the brain, but it's the sense organs of society. Mm -hmm. And that we, if we do our job well, people have a realistic picture of what's out there, where they're moving, what's behind them. And if we don't, people have this kind of fantasy picture. Either they're ill-informed or they have a kind of funhouse vision of how things are. So our highest purpose is to be good sense organs and do some of the initial processing, saying here's what we see and here's what we think it means, but our conclusions about what we think it means are provisional, but we're going to tell you what we see. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's, that's how, uh, so that, that's our job. The, the, there's a, a tension in your work. Uh, uh, which has been reflected in our conversation, which actually may go back uh, to those early days in California. And, and, and on, the, on the one hand, uh, it's, it's what I would call looking for what is new and understanding it, which you've discussed. Yep. But the other is, uh, 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 the other is uh, a sense of being true to yourself. Uh, uh, and in fact, that, that is a theme in, in your book, More Like Us, that, that we need to reform in a way uh, uh, and adapt in, in the face of some of the economic challenges we we're experiencing, but, but that in the end we had to be true to ourselves, basically. Uh, talk a little about that. Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, yes, and, and the point of this book, which I actually had a lot of fun writing, was that... that, that we're talking about More yes. Like Us, yes. Uh, was that there are real differences among societies. One of the points I was trying to make there is that Japan, for example, works best when people have a clear sense of what their place is, mm -hmm. of how they stand relative to everybody else, how they work as a unit. Whereas America worked best when people had no sense of their proper mm -hmm. place and thought, like my dad, that they can imagine some new future for themselves tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You could move to Alaska, take on a new name, and have some, <laughs> your past is erased. For Japan, that would be bad. For us, it, it's good. And so th that uh, there are institutions work best and so do people when they are the best versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. And just to think of the whole range of this, I have two children. They're now, one's still in college, one's recently graduated. They are extremely different kids. They are both very talented. I love them both dearly, but they're very, very different. And each of them will probably end up doing a different thing in his life, and that's good because they would be unhappy in each other's roles, proper walks of life. And so finding the having journalists be the best version of journalists, mm -hmm. and me being the best version of the kind of writing I can do, and America have the best version of the venture capitalist it can do. That, that's one of the things I am preaching. Mm -hmm. Although the word preach, I, I regret this <laughs> instant it comes out of my mouth. If, if uh, uh, students are watching this and they say, hey, I'd like to do some yeah. variant of, of what you do, H how would you tell them to prepare for uh, this kind of uh, that, vocation that you're describing? That, that's an interesting question. Now, one thing I'd say to them to begin with is they should, if they have the slightest inkling, slightest interest in this, they should try it because it really can be fun. I mentioned earlier that writing is hard, and it is. The actual writing of articles is the hardest thing that, that I, I know uh, about doing. But it is enjoyable to be able to learn about things and try to make sense of them. So, and almost everybody I know who's wanted to make a career in the magazine world and book world has. So it's something that is relatively open. I think the best ways to prepare in both pre-college and college are number one, 
frequent practice in writing. It can be even email, but anything that has you writing every day is important. And the other is if there's a single discipline, well, I was going to say if there's a single discipline to study, I won't say that. There are two disciplines to study. One is history, mm -hmm. because it is a very valuable both trick and real thing to be able to put things in some historical context, to say, yes, there's a boom in internet stocks in the 1990s, and how is that like the oil boom of the 70s or the gold boom of the 1840s? So history is very important, and technology is important too, because more and more of the change in the world is driven by infotech and biotech, and so just being comfortable with those things. So learn history, learn technology, and learn, get practice writing, and then you'll be fine. Now, uh, uh, we've talked about things you've written in the past, and, and one of your uh, present concerns is uh, the, the technology and communication revolution that we're undergoing uh, uh, today. Uh, and I thought we would talk a little Good. about that and, and get a sense of, of uh, uh, where your compass, your, uh, uh, your travels, your reporting, and, and your thinking about this. Uh, 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 because it would seem that the, the public dialogue on these issues are, are really important. Uh, is the Internet changing everything uh, in, uh, around us in, in the drastic ways that we first thought? It is changing everything, but I would argue in a different way from what people um, suggest. And I think there's, there's an interesting analogy in business which can apply m more broadly. The business analogy, you and I are speaking in late 2000. In 1999 and 1998, people thought that the business revolution in the Internet would be the dot-com companies themselves. And there was a huge boom, which has, has since, since uh, abated. And it, I think it's become clear that the real effect of the Internet and business for the, the near term will be on other businesses, on old businesses, businesses that could become more efficient, how they use energy, how they get supplies, how they distribute themselves. So car companies, steel companies, mm -hmm. food companies, the Internet will have its real impact there even more than on the dot-com companies. So, so in a way, wiring the, the, the factories and, yes. the, uh, and, and the retailers and so on that are brick-and-mortar establishments, right? right. And, and for, for example, I think the last five years has been the first time in history that as the GNP has gone up, use of electricity has gone down even though the Internet itself consumes a lot of electricity because it's saved so much in existing I industries. More generally, I think the Internet's effect on life, on education, on politics, on culture, on people's interactions will mainly be broadening ways people already interacted rather than having revolutionary transformations. There will be some huge transformations, but for example, email is an extension of the telephone. I mean, you know, it's a sort of asynchronous telephone, mm -hmm. and it, it, it makes a big difference in all of our lives, but it essentially expands something we did before, and I think in almost any realm of life we want to talk about, it's that expansive and additive thing rather than a revolutionary transformation, and in a way that's more important. What about politics? Wasn't, wasn't this supposed to be the campaign that changed everything and, and in fact changed nothing? Well, it, it, um, I actually just finished a huge piece in the New York Review of Books on exactly the, this mm -hmm. theme, whose point was uh, that the Internet was supposed to be, this was supposed to be the Internet's election year, as 1960 was for TV. And in fact, TV was still more important to this election than the Internet was. You know, the televised debates had huge impact, Saturday Night Live had impact, et cetera. And the, the impact of the Internet was, again, long-term and incremental. Uh, email for getting out the vote will have some impact. Email for getting out uh, campaign positions will have some impact. But I think that if it's seen, if the test is not, does this overturn everything we've done before, mm -hmm. but rather, how does it extend in interesting ways mm -hmm. past systems for doing business, then you can see that it has an impact. But So it's that additive effect that I think will be important. Now, what about uh, economic concentration? I mean, in, in the sense that we, we are seeing now that uh, consolidations like Time Warner and AOL and, 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 and so on and so forth, the possibility that Yahoo might, w are, we, are we back to AT&T again in a funny kind of way? Uh, yes. Although AT&T right. is not doing well, <laughs> I know that. Uh, I think that's, this is going to be the most interesting next economic aspect of the Internet. In the mid-1990s, if you ask people in the tech world in general, and the Internet in particular, uh, about what kind of business model they thought they were part of. Of course it would be the small d democratic two kids in a garage, let's start a company model. You know, Yahoo, eBay, these were start, set up by, mm -hmm. by just people out of college, you know, sometimes in college, uh, and so they thought this would be the way to break up big established concentrations. 
But by the end of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s, uh, clearly the Internet was a, a large engine of concentration in the economy. And I think probably the most significant deal of the last 10 years is not so much the Microsoft breakup talks, but rather the AOL Time Warner concentration, because you have uh, you know, the, the big behemoth of online communications with the major cable company, with a major um, magazine firm uh, chain, with a major movie studio. And so all of our conceptions of antitrust and how, how it should be enforced and the effects of concentration in the public life, I think, will need to be rethought. What is the difference when you have so much communications power in one, one company? And so I don't have an answer to that, but I think it'll be the place where many people will be thinking and arguing in the next couple of years. One of the things we're becoming very sensitive to about this new technology is the Napster phenomena. That is that, that uh, the technological, uh, uh, the technology combined with the uh, technical skills of even the youngest people can, can cr create a situation, for example, that one's uh, uh, copyright and one's entitlement to property, to private property of what one has created will be, will be sacrificed. How, how do you think that that will work its way out? Again, will it be institutions adapting but, but no uh, uh, major revolution? Well, it's clear that something will have to work out. You know, when the Napster deal with the Bertelsmann, Bertelsmann was announced and Napster was no longer was just going to give everything away for free, a lot of its constituency among college was just outrage. You know, Napster sells out, et cetera. But it was clear that that was going to happen sooner or later. With each shift in the technology of media, there's been some change in how intellectual property is preserved. When there were printing presses, there was a whole different position that, that authors were in compared to when, the, when there were manuscripts, because you could just, uh, it was a different sort of uh, system for getting their ideas around. When the Xerox machine first came into existence, there was a whole idea of how you're going to control things. And so some new system will evolve because people who create music, people who create books, people who create programs need to be paid somehow. Mm -hmm. So I suspect what will happen is eventually some new system of micro royalties in some sense. Every time you check onto Napster, you will have 25 cents deducted from your account and we'll all go, all go someplace. I think it will be incremental business and legislative deals that by uh, by four or five years from the time you and I are talking, this will all have worked itself out, because that's been the record in the past. Mm -hmm. your, your book, Looking at the Sun, uh, sort of focused in part on the relationship between government and business and, yeah. and, and uh, uh, what government was doing in those situations that furthered uh, the ability to compete. Uh, how has any of your thinking changed in light of, of uh, America's comeback, so right. to speak, uh, as a result of the Internet Revolution. This was a, a book I wrote at a time when the Asian economies were nearing their, their peak and the U.S. economy was beginning its comeback. And I would view much of what's happened there as, as a sort of um, extension of the patterns I, I was talking about in, in the following, I think, interesting ways. One of the big arguments at that time was whether the Japanese economy was basically like Western economies or basically not. And I was in the camp saying this is basically not like the Western economies at all. It's organized for different purposes. And I was considered a racist, et cetera, for saying these things. But I would say the last 10 years has really validated that point of view because from a normal capitalist point of view, they should have made a million changes during the 1990s. They should have uh, liquidated all this bad debt in their banking system. They should have changed their political system, mm -hmm. and they didn't. The preservation of some existing relationships was more important than capitalist vitality mm -hmm. there. For the U.S., I think there's been an interesting working out of the proper balance between state and private uh, interactions for economic growth. The origins of the Internet were heavily state-influenced, mm -hmm. as everyone knows. This was DARPAnet mm -hmm. in its origin, but at a certain point, it was important to have private capital and private ingenuity take over with certain rules set by the government. And I would mm -hmm. say here, the Microsoft antitrust action was a very important rule set by the government. Mm -hmm. By having some limit on Microsoft's power in this world, it said, okay, there'd be certain room for, for new inter enterprise to, to, um, uh, to grow. So I would think that the stagnation of Japan in particular mm -hmm. and the growth of the U.S. in general over the last 10 years mm -hmm. has sort of ratified the point of view I was trying to argue uh, in, in this book. And, and in a way, the, 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 the cultural base 
of the Internet Revolution is, is really the one you're describing from that you first experienced in your California days and then went on to articulate and argue about, namely this, this openness, the upward mobility, the emphasis on the individual and what they can accomplish. Well, it certainly is it's striking to, to look at the statistics on Internet company formation. I believe it's the case that in the year 1999 in California, most technology startups were founded by immigrants. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to California, people actually mm -hmm. born, especially in China and India, but not mm -hmm. just you know Asian Americans, mm -hmm. but actual actual immigrants. And so there is something in the culture of venture capital, the culture of startups. Now, of course, there are factors other than that culture too. For example, in the year 2000, the culture still remains, but the market has been really sliding. And so mm -hmm. it's a combination of the cultural predisposition, which makes it easier to do these things in San Jose than in Warsaw mm -hmm. or in you know uh, Ulan Bator or someplace else, and the underlying fundamentals of flows of money, interest rates, et cetera. And those have had a very productive mix in the last decade. Uh, we're coming to the end of the hour, but I, I wanted to go back to, to this, this main theme in your life's work, which is writing, uh, articulating issues, and, and something that was stuck there in your veto, which is that for two years you were a speechwriter uh, for President Carter. And I, I'm just curious uh, what uh, you learned from that experience and what, what the difference is in uh, the kind of writing that you do, which, which is, in a way, sort of laying out the geography as you travel uh, from issue to issue or from place to place. In terms of what I learned about life in general, I learned a lot about government. In particular, it's made me, the experience has made me very skeptical of conspiracy views of, uh, of history. I know that one of your, you've interviewed Oliver Stone before, whose movies I admire a lot, but he has a sort of uh, conspiratorial view of life, which in government is very hard to believe because you see how mistakes are usually the explanation. <laughs> now, maybe that was just the Carter administration, but certainly that was <laughs> mistake, blunder, misinformation. So I learned that I learned how hard it is to work in government. I learned that I, in particular, wasn't interested in doing that again. I was honored to do it for two years, but not anymore. What I learned about writing was actually useful in a way that you've, you've gotten at, because um, I think of my own journalistic work as, as being constantly measured against the test of clarity, that what you want finally to do is to have the most clearly comprehensible description of how things are and how they fit together. And in political writing, that's not what you want to do. In political writing, you want to be just clear enough that half the people will still agree with you. <laughs> and that, that, you know, there's a certain, uh, when, when, you're, uh, when you're writing uh, journalistically, you want to say, okay, this is exactly what I saw. And people can agree or disagree. When you're writing for a president, you want to say, okay, this is the direction we should go. And you're only going to describe it so that still, you know, 51% of the people will go in that direction. That was a useful lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. Jim, thank you very much for taking this time and, and giving us this uh, uh, overview of uh, your uh, very exciting uh, uh, trip and reportage uh, on those various trips and the topics in different parts of the world. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure, Harry. Thank, thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.